So um, this is our story. Uh, it's an intensely personal story. Uh, it's the story of building a company called Flixwitch, uh, originally in South Africa and now uh, expanding into the African continent. We've split our scaling story up into multiple parts. I will deal with the zero to one part. This is going from nothing to something. Wayne will talk about one to infinity. We'll have a bit of time for some reflective thoughts at the end and some uh, Q&A. So this is where we are now. Uh, we're trading in some shape or form in nine countries on the African continent. Uh, we've got 200,000 SIM cards under management. We do about 20,000 billing events a day. Uh, we ship around 5,000 physical SIM cards to our customers every month. And we have about 1,800 customers. All of this is built on top of the prepaid infrastructure of telcos on the continent. This is the team, uh, at least the management team. Uh, Willem Malerbe is the finance guy on the left. Uh, I'm the current managing director. Hein in the middle looks after sales and marketing. Uh, Rudy is our new business development guy. We call him the operator whisperer. And Wayne is head of engineering. So zero to one. Uh, I'm sure many of you know this book. This is the concept of creation, of moving from something to nothing, of being unviable, being an idea to viability, finding product market fit. It's at once the most magical and the most excruciatingly painful part of most companies' journeys. But first, a little bit about myself. So, like Mike says, he struggles to pronounce Afrikaans names. My name's actually a Dutch name. Uh, it's correct pronunciation is Kees. I grew up in a Dutch home to Dutch immigrants in Johannesburg. Uh, and upon going to an Afrikaans school in the 70s, I discovered that this also means baboon in Afrikaans. So, Kees became Kies, and uh, as you guys know, kids can be pretty merciless. This is a logo soup of some of the institutions that have played a part in my career and my education. Um, so top left, I went completion of schooling, I went to study computer science, or what was called Rekenaar Wetenskap at the Ranse Afrikaanse Universiteit. This is uh, now called UJ, University of Johannesburg. Um, what was quite peculiar in, uh, in the 90s, early 90s, when I attended that institution, uh, we had to do all our papers in, in Afrikaans, in pure Afrikaans. So you got extra marks if you got your terminology right. Um, so I've got a whole bunch of useless facts in my head. Um, for example, an API in Afrikaans is called a Toepassingsprogrammeringskoppelvlak. I bet. <laughs> Following my studies, uh, I got the opportunity to go study abroad in a place called Syracuse. I went to Syracuse University and did a master's in computer science. Uh, Syracuse, I also find out, is one of, and this is a word in America, the snowiest places in the world. Um, and yeah, quite hard to adapt, but had a, a fantastic time there. I started my career in Boston on the, on the Cambridge side of the river, working for a firm called Cambridge Technology Partners, um, and started as a programmer. Um, spent uh, time working on a variety of different projects, variety of different products. Uh, got exposed to telephony for the first time. Uh, did some work in the insurance sector. Transferred to the UK operation and uh, then uh, joined Deutsche Bank. Uh, spent a couple of years at Deutsche Bank working on back office reconciliation systems. Came back to SA around uh, the end of 2001. Uh, joined Discovery. I spent uh, a year and a bit working on Discovery Life's, uh, well, the first iteration of Discovery Life's claim system. So a recurring theme in, uh, in my career up to that point was dealing with legacy. Um, and this is a common theme, I'm sure, for a lot of you in this room. If you're working in finance or insurance, uh, legacy is, is what it's about. Um, and this often entails integrating into ugly, um, you know, back-end APIs that aren't well documented. Um, so it turns out pretty good learnings if you intend to go into the telco world. Um, another common recurring theme was uh, an excruciating amount of waste. So many projects, so many death marches that never saw the light of day. Um, and uh, I think that was you know, a, a fairly common experience in, in those days. But also on the money, on the money side, um, ironically, we were being paid better probably than most people are still being paid today. Um, my most lucrative gig was uh, writing VBA macros and Excel spreadsheets for traders at uh, Dresdner. I got paid the royal sum of 550 pounds a day to do so. So, um, 
fast forward, uh, this is around 2003, um, I'm talking to a, a good varsity mate of mine in a, in a pub in Joburg one night. Um, they had just been awarded a service provider license by Vodacom. He was the FD of a company called Smartcall. And uh, Telco back in those days looked uh, very different to what it did today. I mean, Dale alluded to some of the challenges. But, you know, airtime was distributed as physical scratch cards. There wasn't a lot of tech at the point of sale. Um, SIM card distribution, there were a lot of financial events uh, involved in that. And Leon Richards, the, the FD, their challenge was basically you know, building software to, to help them tackle the informal sector. Um, I thought this sounded pretty exciting, so I signed up, um, built up a, a, an engineering team, and we set to work. And uh, it was one of the most uh, interesting and, and gratifying times of my career, because we could see the difference that our work made to our customers and to the business. So I spent five years working for Telco. So in terms of Telco, what does it look like to build on top of Telco? <laughs> so, some of you might have heard this term, VAS. So if you approach a Telco with some fantastic idea, you probably end up in front of the VAS team. VAS stands for Value Added Services. It's also short for Vaseline. <clears throat> and, um, and so there's a whole collection of protocols there. Uh, you got some USSD and SMS, you got uh, Web, Web, WIG, and OBS and EBB. OBS and EBB, these are um, online billing or event-based billing. This uh, can be used to uh, you know, put your hand into a subscriber's pocket and take a little bit of their airtime. Um, and I say Vaseline because a lot of this tool set has been used in this country by fairly unscrupulous uh, people to, um, to screw their customers. Um, so the tech isn't inherently evil. We built some pretty cool stuff on that, um, but most of that was aimed at airtime and product distribution. Uh, point two there, the, the IN. So access into the IN meant that you were able to vend airtime without requiring a, form, uh, a PIN in any form. Um, and you know, if you buy airtime or data button on the internet or through an ATM today, chances are the IN is involved. And uh, you know, thirdly, via other APIs, there's a ton of APIs sort of you know, inside telco world. Vendors supply products, those products have APIs. But generally speaking, those aren't exposed to the external world, and often it's quite difficult to get, gain access to them. We were fortunate, because the guy at the helm of Vodacom at the time was a guy called Eleanor Craig. Eleanor Craig is one of the most courageous, but also outrageous leaders of any business in this country. Um, but yeah, he took Vodacom from zero to one, or his, uh, his visionary leadership um, was, was instrumental in making that happen. And his view to partners, and his view to us as a service provider, was basically to give you pervasive access into the network in the form of APIs. So you were able to build software, and the reasoning being you would use that, uh, that access to uh, you know, further Vodacom's goals, i.e. distribution of their product. But those APIs made a few other things possible, and having access to them sort of set off a little light bulb in my head that started to shimmer. Um, but, you know, legacy, a lot of these APIs, um, the, the IN I spoke about, those are ISO 8583 APIs. Um, the the, the back-end SP API is built on Corba, and like its dyslexic namesake, one byte can kill you. So the problem, and uh, I mean, Dale sort of hinted at it. <laughs> so, funny enough, Nominee was actually one of our customers, and, and uh, one of the attack vectors I was hoping Dale was going to mention is that thing's got a SIM card inside it. So if you deploy that device into the informal sector, they will find a way to break it open, usually using an axe or some uh, blunt implement, and they will get to the SIM card and take out the SIM card and, and uh, you know, try to use it, because, hey, uh, it's free money, right? And uh, you know, this, uh, this kind of thing happened over and over, and we heard about it because we were in the industry. So a lot of guys were struggling with specifically point-of-sale devices in the, in the informal sector. And there was this thing happening. So at the time, it was called the machine-to-machine -machine world, and uh, now it's called the Internet of Things or the Fourth Industrial Revolution. But there's all this tech that's being built on top of uh, the, you know, the GSM infrastructure. A lot of it needs SIMs, and a lot of those SIMs are difficult to manage. So what if we could build and automate on prepaid and have it behave like postpaid? What if we could charge people for this? And what if we could solve this problem, you know, solve the problem of managing more than a handful of SIMs? It's not difficult to control the spend on the SIM in your pocket or the SIM in your router. But throw 100 SIM cards at you, yeah, good luck. And this kind of shit happens all the time. So SIM cards get you know, hacked out of traffic lights. For our foreign visitors, these are called robots in South Africa. Um, 
and I can only imagine how that transpired. So, some UK, probably British uh, engineer installing the first traffic light, and a country bumpkin walks up to me and says, What is that? Is it, uh, this, sir, is a traffic light to regulate the flow of traffic. I say, Ach, man, it's a robot. <laughs> but so, this particular little incident cost the city of Joburg 9 million Rand, and uh, I've you know, that's not counting the amount of time and, and pain that uh, commuters had to suffer through with broken traffic lights. So what we also realized at the onset was that, uh, you know, if you consider a long tail distribution or a dinosaur with a long tail, um, the head of the tail, or the head of the distribution, these are big companies, big companies with massive estates of devices. They don't generally have this problem because they've got an engineering team, they've got SLAs from the operators, they've got infrastructure in place to manage their connectivity. Those aren't our target customers. Nomanini is a target customer, and the hundreds of other companies like that. Every company doing anything in IoT also starts at the bottom of the tail. So when you're in that stage, you, know, you don't know how long your business is going to last. You're not in a position to sign a contract because you probably won't pass credit vetting. So you're forced into that prepaid world, and you know, we thought we had the solution for you. But just quickly back into the personal story. So around 2005, we had our own zero to one moment as a family. My son was born. 2006, a mere 13 months later, my first daughter was born. Flixich was founded in 2007, and uh, the story of the logo, we often ask, what is it? Is it a moth? Is it a butterfly? It's a moth. Um, and that's some of the most expensive cheese everywhere uh, in the world. And uh, we paid a branding company uh, 50,000 rand of our uh, seed money to, uh, to come up with this. Um, <laughs> And that was a pretty cheesy tagline. So, so solutions enhancement magic. That, uh, that we ditched. We kept the moth and we kept the name. And um, you know, deeper reflection on sort of moths and startups and you know, flying into a fire and getting burned. But none of that was uh, part of the conversation. It was just a cool logo. So in 2008, um, my second daughter, Carla, was born. So we now had three kids under three. Um, and a baby business that was uh, still very much in its infancy. And then this happened. So out of the blue, um, I get a testicular cancer diagnosis. Um, I, <clears throat> yeah, obviously shocked to the system. Um, and in one of the greatest incidents I know of, of nominal determinism, my urologist was called Dr. Peter Harden. <laughs> I don't know if I'm violating the code of conduct, sorry, but. <laughs> so Dr. Peter explained to me what, what a rad radical orchidectomy was. So I lost a little bit of, uh, of my body. Um, I then had to go for chemotherapy, uh, six weeks of intensive treatment, um, and they really throw it at you. The hormonal cancers you know, tend to happen to people in the 20s, 30s, 40s. So the theory is you can take it. You know? So you get, you get a pump full of uh, loads of drugs. Um, and you basically feel like you're 85 years old. Um, so I moved out of my house. So I went to live with my parents for a bit. The guy top right, <clears throat> yeah, he moved into, um, geez, sorry. Um, yeah, that's my brother-in-law. So he basically was standing dead for my kids for a while. And um, yeah, so <clears throat> back, um, back to work, beginning 2009. And, um, you know, this is a difficult time. So this was our first real existential crisis. So we sort of had a product, didn't really have anybody out selling it. Um, we'd sort of run out of our seed money. We didn't take VC money. We put our own money in. Liquidated savings, accessed my bond. Um, but, yeah, so I had to take my begging bowl and uh, go to friends and family and ask for some more. And I had to hit the road and start selling this product. <clears throat> And then this happened, and this was for us a miracle. And that's not Jesus there, that's a guy called Peter Everett. Peter Everett was the, uh, in, uh, the CEO of a company called CFS, and CFS manufactured that terminal. That terminal is known as the Rika terminal. And that terminal was uh, designed and developed to go out into the informal sector and ensure that people deriving their livelihood from the sale of SIM cards and airtime uh, wouldn't get disenfranchised. So the operators were forced to pay for this. It happened really quickly, but there were 30,000 of these terminals rolled out in the space of less than a year, and uh, we got the deal to manage the SIM cards in those terminals that, uh, that were used for, um, for, for communication with, uh, with the back-end servers. So that for us was a massive deal. 
that moved us to viability almost overnight. All of a sudden, we could pay salaries, and uh, I am very grateful to Peter Everett. He was our Messiah. So, Miracle 2.0, yes, I had another child. So, I said, <laughs> we had another child. I did this with my wife. But, uh, so, so, Emma was born. Um, and, you know, if you have the kind of cancer I had, and you're limited to just one uh, testicle, and um, you've gone for the kind of chemo I went through, the chances of you losing your fertility are pretty good. So, Emma looks like me. She's definitely my child. <laughs> So, so in terms of the, the, the company, um, we were growing fairly linearly. Um, the, the RICA project had sort of tapered off. Growth was okay, but we were growing linearly. Um, and we got to what I called our diversification station. So this is when we asked ourselves, um, you know, the risk of just one country, just one network. How can we mitigate that? And the, the answer to that is, you know, do more stuff. So try and expand, build out of the products. So we took a two-pronged approach. We went to Kenya, and uh, we had an in with uh, one of the operators there, so uh, we started that conversation, and we launched another business, a business called Nerve Data. So Nerve Data was going to go out and build an IoT platform, and uh, it was going to rule the world and be amazing and make us lots of money. So Nerve Data was a massive mistake, um, so we... <laughs> That's a pile of cash. So that pile of cash was, uh, in our case, 5 million rand um, over the space of um, about three, three years or so that went up in flames. Um, we also seconded one of our directors, Hein, to go run Nerve Data. And that's a story for another day. But every card has a silver lining. When we decided to close that business and liquidate it, um, Hein came back and took over sales and marketing again. So the other prong of the scaling approach was to go into other markets. Um, and at this point, we discovered that the tech stack that we had built to date uh, wasn't ideally suited to scaling. It was a LAMP stack with a bunch of Java as the glue in between. And um, you know, copying and pasting that and catering to the idiosyncrasies of every single operator meant multiple code bases, long drawn out release cycles, and lots of pain. What also happened? So, uh, two technical co-founders decided um, that they had had enough of this journey. They decided to up sticks and uh, immigrate to Canada, seeking greener, maybe whiter pastures. Um, at the same time, Willem showed up. Willem had been working for a uh, telco in Europe for Vodafone for a number of years, focused on the SME sector. Willem liked the story, liked what we were doing, and he uh, wanted to invest. So a deal happened. The co-founders exited, they uh, gave us three months notice, um, Willem bought their shares, and we had three months to find a replacement for our engineering team. What also happened is Rudy came on board. So Rudy had a long experience of selling telco software to operators. He had a very strong relationship with Namibia, uh, with uh, MTC, the, the, the dominant network in Namibia. And Rudy had been squatting in our office for a, a, a number of years. Um, and Rudy uh, approached MTC. MTC had internally built a similar product to, to ours, um, but it was uh, irritating the crap out of them because you know, they were giving it to customers for free, um, and uh, it wasn't really working that well. So for two to series of events, we got to take over the existing customer base. We got to integrate our software into MTC, and we got 12,000 SIM cards added to our pool in uh, one file swoop. But we still had that problem to crack of uh, finding a new engineering team. So, into Wayne. I don't know how many of you are old enough to remember this, but this is from Wayne's World. So, I was introduced to Wayne Pringlewood by a mutual friend, a guy called Mark Refuen, also in the tech space. Mark's building a really interesting business in, uh, in Stellenbosch called Pseudonym. Um, and Mark had worked with Wayne in, uh, in a previous life. So, they'd worked together at Mixit. Um, Wayne had done some really interesting stuff before that with Lufthansa, building... Uh, um, cargo control or cargo management systems. He had a stint at Cajiso Media working on streaming platforms. So Wayne, Wayne had cut his engineering teeth and uh, more important than anything to me is he had built up a team. So I met Wayne, I shared my idea and my dreams with him, I showed him what we had done to date and uh, Wayne said that looked pretty interesting but let's go check out the tech. At which point I want to hand over to Wayne. <laughs> So, um, 
first thing I do when I arrive at Flix, which is I fly to Joburg to meet the old engineering team. And um, I'm presented uh, with the, the software and kind of like walk around it like you had a used cars dealer. The guy kicks the tires, opens up the hood, shows me what's inside and um, says, okay, cool, it's yours. And I fly back to Cape Town and I'm like, oh shit, I've got a problem here, right? So I don't know if you guys know what car this is. This is a Peugeot 504, okay? And maybe Dale's seen a couple of them up in Ghana. Um, maybe he's even been in some of them. But this is the most uh, pervasive car in the whole of Africa, right? And if you've ever been in one, you would be like, in the back of one, catching a ride from an airport somewhere, you'd be like, no way am I, go am I getting to my destination, okay? But the guy's driving it, he has absolute confidence in this thing, right? He knows exactly how this thing runs. He knows how to start it. He knows um, why there's a tire on the roof, why there's a, it's chocked by a, 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 a rock underneath it, and like um, how, long, how many k's he can do before it overheats, right? Suddenly, I was driving this thing, okay? And it was like, mm, I'm not so happy about this. The other problem is, is that this thing actually pays the bills. Right? So the guy who's driving this is driving this as a profession, and this was our software. It was paying the bills. So you come in there and you'd be like, oh, cool. Um, we got this thing, and now um, I don't actually know how to drive it, but it's paying the bills. So if I looked at the tech stack, there were some major problems. There was no test coverage, so I couldn't see the wood from the trees. Uh, things were named after trees. And then other things were named after birds. And then there was some code in there that was like, nah, don't worry about this. This is old code and we, we don't use this anymore. So in the process of the handover from the old tech team, thinking, okay, cool, we're going to Canada. I asked the guy, please, can you just write me a little bit more documentation about how this thing works? So he's like, yeah, this is how you change this password and this password. Uh, tap your head three times, log on to this server, stop the service, and you should be good. I screwed that up the first 10 times I did it. At the end of the, um, the readme, in the repo, he was like, may the Corba gods smile on you. Good luck, have fun. <laughs> <laughs> so immediately I was like <laughs> Anyway. Um, so Kiss alluded to this thing, like now we're in Kenya when we're servicing customers in Kenya, right? What had happened is that they'd copied and pasted this, this code from basically internal Hetzner hosting into AWS. So we're in the cloud now, we're cool, right? However, if you wanted to scale the stuff at this point, you had to buy another taxi, right? And it was hard enough trying to drive one taxi. I'm not, I'm not driving two at a time, right? So um, I get back to Cape Town and I'm like, cool, game plan time. And I think this talks to FlickSwitch as a company that there's implicit trust among everybody who, who works there. Because if you had a guy who had been working for you for like two weeks and he says to you, hey, Kiss, the thing that you've been doing for eight years is not going to work, right? This is not going to scale. We're not going to win here, yeah, right? And it was over a cup of coffee. Um, Flix, which was, was still had been there. Um, we used to have an office above being there and we had a cup of coffee. And Kiss was like, oh, okay, cool. And he swallowed the pill and we were all in for a rewrite, okay, from the ground up. So going back to that picture of Rudy and Kiss and, 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 the, and the, the deal with MTC, that was probably the most fortunate thing that could happen to an engineering team because we had a greenfields type of approach where we could re iter iteratively rebuild the product. So the first step was, cool, we're going to service the Namibian clients, and we had some sort of scale, like 12,000 sims to manage. is not a great amount of sims, but it's not a small amount of sims where you don't get any data from it. We started this off, and it was me and one other guy. And in two months, we had something that was working in, in, in production, and we were billing sims, recharging sims, monitoring data usage, and the customers were overjoyed. So the net promoter score was like 80 or something. Like guys in the movie were like, you guys are fantastic. MTC sucks. You guys are amazing. OK? Um, when we started rewriting this thing, we. Myself and the other guy who, who, who was there, we had some Django Python experience. So it was basically like, hey, um, we're going to rewrite this thing. 
uh, throw up a Django site, and we have some load on the back end, so we're going to smash some salary workers on the back end and call it good. Deploy to Google, Google Kubernetes, and, we, and we're rocking and rolling. We're not going to care much about what else happens on the back end. We've got a problem to solve, and we're going to do this. Onwards and upwards. I'm sitting in ScaleCon, so fast forward a year. We're in production in a few other places. We've migrated some data over. I'm sitting in, at the back there by that screen, and Ken Beck is talking in his loud shirt, and everyone's like, yeah, this guy's the most awesome scale con speaker ever. He's got the best shirt and all that sort of stuff. And he's doing those, the, that graph thing where he's going extract value or expand, right? And I'm just sitting there going, oh, what the hell have I done, right? I'm busy doing a rewrite, and this guy's like, yeah, at some point you've got to extract value. And um, I'm sitting there going, have I made the right decision? Okay, as a technical decision. So I'll come back to why that decision later. So now there's two of us in an engineering team that used to be four big, and we're rewriting a new tech stack. I'm managing um, some of the old tech stack, driving Peugeot down the road, and we're managing new customers and onboarding and migrating all of our, our, our customer base over. So I think when you're talking about scale and trying to move forward, you have to talk about people. And this is the most important thing that um, I feel that will make a, a difference in, in your engineering team and how, how you go forward. Uh, so we were talking at, about this at the speaker dinner last night, and it's like the glue that, that does everything in, in between um, the things. Like the technical things are the technical things, but the people things are the people things. Um, and I was trying to hire people. And this was just when, the, when Office N was there, and they had that like um, instant launch. You used to be able to like launch your profile, and you, I was there clicking the refresh button like every 30 seconds. Is there a new guy? Is there a new guy? And I hired four people like really, really quickly off Office N, and I've hired some really amazing people off Office N. However, I was under pressure to hire people, and I've made some really bad mistakes hiring people. If there's one thing I can say when you're hiring people is that if there's any doubt in your mind, there's no doubt. Don't hire that person. Okay? The amount of time that you're going to spend trying to have, get that person to integrate into your team is not worth the, worth, the, worth, worth the cost or the effort. If you do hire a person like this, be an adult about it, rip the Band-Aid off, and walk away. It'll save you a lot of time in, in the future. Okay. When we hired, oh sorry, not, not that one, that one still, okay. So when we hired people, we had things like technical practices in mind. We're gonna build this awesome team and we're gonna do continuous deployments and TDDs are gonna be the ethos and all this sort of stuff. However, those things are like innate in, in us as software developers and everyone wants to do that stuff. Some of the context aware stuff that happens within a team is like, how, does you, how do you build a team that reacts to your context and what happens with you and your team on a daily basis? So some of the things we came to value was uh, being able to respond to how the telcos change things around us and being able to respond to repair time. So some of those things like happen because you're doing continuous deployment, but some of them um, happen because you give people responsibility and give people the, the ability to... Um, to take control and trust of, uh, that they're, they're going to do the best job. So what does that look in telco land, right? So this is, uh, this is a slide of some plugs, and this is a slide of, uh, of, uh, of some telco wires going together. But we integrate into a lot of telco APIs, and every single integration is very, very different. Okay? So um, one day we could be inter, uh, integrating into, into a Corba based API or an RPC based API. Next thing could be an ISO 8385 API. Next thing could be a SOAP API. Next thing you're shooting um, XML at a socket and something comes back. And every single network is very, very different. And this is done on purpose. Networks, mobile networks, are not good at anything other than taking your money, right, and connecting your calls. If you had to do anything, if, Mobile networks have no ability to provide services on top of like that, that stuff. So APIs are provided by vendors, and vendors love lock-in. 
So all of these APIs are old SOAP APIs, and I could go on for, for hours about how, how APIs um, return data and headers, and two APIs that are for the same network on different ports are totally two, two, two totally different versions. Um, the thing is, is that we have more compute in the cloud than a telco has um, in, on premise. So this causes us a problem, is that we have to now abstract the telco API to be something that um, is understandable for our customers and also understandable for us. So going back to another story. The middle of last year, so last year the strategy um, at Flixwitch was make our software more um, uh, software as a service-like, help customers onboard quickly, okay, and automate all the things. So about halfway through the year, I took on a role from straight engineering and um, I took over the ops team, which was another five people. And if you are an engineering, if you're in any, in any engineering role or you manage engineers, the most valuable thing you can do is run an ops team for a while because it gives you unbelievable data points about how to automate stuff and how to make the biggest impact. So some of, our some of the biggest impact I made last year was just by getting people to categorize support tickets and finding out how to automate that and remove that, remove that task from them. So things like automating a payment feed from our bank, right? Or, or automating how, um, the SIM ordering process. So we ship 5,000 SIMs a month. Okay, it's not a small task. Once you, once you automate that process, you drop your ticket volume by 80%. Suddenly your ops people have freedom to service your customers better. Some of our uh, sort of values in, in operations is that when somebody phones us, um, they, they get to speak to a real human. Another value is that we can ship up to 1,000 SIMs within 24 hours to your doorstep, activated, ready to go with airtime or data on it. No other company I know of in South Africa can do that, not even the network. So there are, so now you guys say, okay, cool. When you've given us an, an overview of like what you've done, but you haven't really gotten into the nitty gritty of, 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 of your tech stack or, or scaling stuff or anything like that. I don't think that's really relevant nowadays. It's like, because you guys could go and read on Google, it's like, how do you scale Kubernetes engine? They will tell you, anyone else will tell you, just add more compute to the thing. Couple more MacBooks, you're good to go, right? Like shard your database. You, nothing I tell you is gonna have any relevant impact into what, what you, what's gonna help you scale your tech, st tech stack. Um, what we have found is that if your, if your sales team, Rudy and the rest of our sales guys are not firing, and you as an engineering team are not enabling that sales team to fire, there's nothing to scale. So that's one of the core principles that we, we kind of work on. Also, we're kind of working on the, the principle of we at the edge of capacity all the time. So our cluster is optimized for, for what capacity we're doing at the moment, and if we increase that capacity, there has to be a very good reason for that. So we're trying to optimize costs from the start. Um, I mentioned that we started with um, Python and Django, and our stack is still Python and Django, and this is 90% great for what we, what, what we do, right? Like, so nowadays, I don't believe, like, if you chose Spring MVC, if you chose Rails, if you chose Node or whatever, you'd still come to the, 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 the same sort of outcome, okay? Um, there are a few things, so, and, but the things that, that, Django and Python have enabled us to do is to scale out into nine countries, nine billing currencies, and, um, and affect the, the lead time of, go, of integrating with an operator from three to six months not down to two weeks. So we can scale out with like Django sites, like a new site and a new billing currency within two weeks, and we're ready to roll. That is something that is important to us in, this, in the scales and in, in the sales team. Um, Talking to some of the other speakers, I look back now and I think about some of the problems that we solved um, coming to this, this place now and some of the things that I would say that we wouldn't need to solve again if I was a little bit more intelligent about the situation. Auth, right, is a, is, is a problem that nobody should solve here, right? So you should just speak to Ben from Auth0 and, and, and sign up for Auth0, right? Uh, we use a lot of feature switches because we have to switch stuff on and off for um, 
for, for different networks in different countries and tax rates and things like that. It's a problem we shouldn't have solved. You should have just spoken to Heidi about that, right? Like, th those are problems that you shouldn't solve. When you're trying to scale a product, you also should think about what are you trying to solve and what are you good at solving, right? So Dell built hardware and they were good at solving that problem, but it wasn't relevant anymore, right? We are good at making sure that we can manage sims. We're not good at auth, right? We're not good at um, some other things that we, we do as well. Um, we need to focus in the future more on the good things that we do and be able to execute on that. So I said we're like 90% 90, 90 great on our Django Python stack. And you mentioned, I mentioned that um, we, we slapped Celery on the back end and we're like, cool, this is good to go. Uh, if you open the Celery GitHub uh, repo and you click the issues, you could throw a dart at the issues and land on anyone, and we've had that issue out of every, like every single time you throw a dart, I'll tell you that we've had that issue, right? I've never en encountered a piece of software that is that fragile in my life ever. Like we're running like three versions behind of, of, of everything because the thing just doesn't work, right? So you, you're queuing the amount of tasks that we do, you're like, nah, this is not good. And those, those are problems that we have to solve in the future is like actually how do we, how do we, how do we um, parallel, uh, process a ton of tasks with what we have at the moment? And I don't think we have the answer yet. So I, I know everyone was, was so enamored by the GraphQL thing earlier, and there's a lot of questions. Um, we also try and, and, and forecast what's going to happen within the market in the next six to 18 months. And I try to get my devs to think about that. And one of the things that we were thinking of is like GraphQL is this, this, this next thing. So um, part of our migration strategy was to um, create an API for our customers to interact with. And we have a lot of data points about sims. So a lot of data points, balances, usage, recharges, the network state, um, where the sim is, uh, how many connections, how many sessions it's had in the last 24 hours. So we're like, cool, uh, GraphQL was the thing to do. Um, so we went about and we rolled a GraphQL um, API and we released it to our customers. I'm surprised that someone hasn't walked into my office and punched me in the face. This was probably the worst decision that we made as a tech team in the last 18 months. And I'll tell you why. GraphQL is great as a tech, right? There's two problems. One, if you're building the front end and the back end, you can control everything. You can deprecate fields, you can add fields, it's all good. As soon as you try and communicate between two services or two, two autonomous um, things, it's a terrible idea, right? People don't want it. They want simple, restful, get my data out of the system. Dale talked about um, some of the stuff about like, hey, uh, we have to limit how much data we get out of the thing. We had to write so much custom code around GraphQL to ensure that um, somebody would, would hit us with 50,000 sims and, they, and we'd, we'd have to enforce paging and we have to do query, query optimization and things like that. It was like, this thing is, just seems harder than what it is to implement. This could have been a lot simpler in REST. Um, so I think in the future, that will probably be one of our, our, our rewrites that, that's going to happen. Um, so yeah, now Kes is going to share some of his learnings about like... Uh... Thanks, Wayne. Um, yeah, so just some uh, reflective thoughts. I can, uh, you know, 2020 hindsight. All of this seems clear in retrospect um, and wasn't necessarily at the time. So. Um, the first thing, and, and this is, might be a learning if, if you're planning to take your business into Africa, is that uh, where you're sitting right now, mm, this is not really Africa. You're doing business in Africa requires a lot of patience, a lot of perseverance, and a lot of patience. Um, an overnight success with all the ups and downs along the way, I don't know, Dale, takes around 10 years, maybe more. Nerve data probably blew our timeline out a little bit, but... Um, yeah, and uh, nothing focuses the mind more than having your actual balls on the line. 
So this is just a, a slide of, of our, our financial uh, overview. So the, the red sliver at the top of that graph is, is what gets me really excited because that's the revenue derived um, outside of South Africa. Um, and so next year we should hit, it's a vanity number, it's a turnover number, but next year we should hit 100 million rand in turnover. So I just want to leave you with a quote. And uh, you know, flying in the face of conventional vis wisdom, I'm actually going to read this to you. Um, so, it is not the critic who counts, it's not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who's actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again because there's no effort without error and shortcoming. But who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy course, who at the best knows in the end triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. This is uh, by Teddy Roosevelt. I don't think he was talking about IT at the time. <laughs> but if you're a cold and timid soul, get in the arena, take up arms. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We've got time for two questions and then we'll go to a break. So if you have a question that doesn't get picked, then you can chat to them in the break. Two questions. Right at the run. Uh, this is a question regarding the rewrite. So you were mentioning the, the legacy uh, code and all of that, they had no tests. After the rewrite, did you still actually include tests or don't you believe in test-driven development? <laughs> you know, our, our test coverage is 98.5%. Uh, wow, okay. 